Hi guys, I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of TNT Garage. I'm standing outside today because, well, I don't know why. Anyway, today we're going to do a little bit of cylinder head tech. And if you're a gearhead like me, you've got plenty of crap laying around. And you want to finish one project. And luckily you have some parts left over from another. So, I'm going to show you how to scrounge what you need off of stuff you already have to complete a project. And that's going to start with getting the old TPI 305 out of my storage shed, aka the Brute Farce Ram. So first step is getting that truck fired up, getting it up to the garage so we can get the powertrain out of the back of it. So let's get to it. stone dead in this so we're gonna pull that out and uh i'm gonna put this brand new battery here that i have that uh that came out of my red truck so it should start this 488 cubic inches of garbage actually this truck runs pretty good let's uh get that connected got to have a battery tool of course well it had, oh I broke it that's why well that's not good well we'll just go ahead and make sure it's got a good connection I just need something to kind of hold that in there wonder if I jam this screw in that eh, I don't know well we'll just do this for now just go ahead and clamp use the auxiliary battery cable clamp here there let's see if she fires up oh ratchet Well, I'm tired of waiting there with the tires there. There's still wheels, you know. Rubber will give it traction. We'll just close the hood enough to where I can see. Try not to ground out the battery on the hood. And you know, I have this really nice harp on here. As you can see, I mean, she's, she's in perfect shape. So we're gonna carefully take that off <sighs> by, you know, just driving out from underneath it. Let's see. Oh, well, we got good oil pressure. It ain't overheating. There's actually fuel in it. It's charging. We're gonna need this salt. I might have to take a minute to move. I don't know if this thing's gonna move. It 
it leaks transmission fluid out of the pan. So, oh, is it going to do anything? No. Maybe. Oh, there we go. Should be at four wheel now. Ah, there we go. Look at that. I think we need to put some juice in it. Oh, God, that shifter's stiff. Oh, there's reverse. There's drive. There we go. See? Look at that. Tarp right off. Yeah, I think before we go too far, I'm gonna put some transmission fluid in here so I don't burn up this 47 RE. Uh, so, we'll be right back and then we'll get it up front. Well, well, you know what, I'm completely out of ATF, so we'll run the Hemi down to Ace Hardware here, which, you know, Ace also stands for all costs excruciating, but is what it is and we're close. It's pretty sad that that old 488 cubic inch V10 makes almost, oh, 85 less horsepower than this Eagle headed 5.7, but on the plus side, the V10 sounds worse. Off days. All right, got back from the hardware store. Let's go ahead and put some transmission fluid in this thing so it moves. Now, one thing to remember with older Chryslers and their transmissions is that when you check them to fill them, GM and all that, you do it in park. And these, you want to have them in neutral. So remember that. That's That way you get it properly filled up. So we're going to fire back up if I left the keys in it. There they are. Come on, start. He is a sweet run motor. So cycle it through the gears, reverse drive, reverse drive, neutral, and check it. pull the old dipstick out. Oh, don't you die on me. I just said you were good running. Oh, it's trying to kick itself into gear. The linkage is all screwed up. The last thing I need is to get run over by my own. a lesson for you when the shift quadrant ain't working go ahead and verify that it's in neutral before you stand in front of it yeah we got nothing so Typically on a newer Mopar transmission, you want to run ATF plus four. I'm not doing that because this is eventually going to get drained to fix that hand leak anyway. So, we'll see if we can get her to move. Go ahead and put two quarts on it because there was nothing on the stick. She might behave a little better now. 
see if it goes in here a little easier. neutral that's a pretty good guess being a transmission whisperer I am two quarters put it right below minimum which is enough to get it up there without causing any damage but I wanted to show you guys something. This is a farmer owned truck and you gotta appreciate the ingenuity. So, obviously V10 had a plow mount on it. But look at this vacuum line repair. That is the case of a pen from a local bank because, I, yeah, it works, I guess. I don't feel any vacuum leaks, a whole lot of electrical tape, a little gaff tape. I mean, ingenuity. So, let's get this thing up to the garage, get the motor out of it. Well, not this motor, the one in the back, in the storage compartment. extend my boom a little bit but get this old dead 305 out of here because I want the 700 R4 I want the accessories off the front ah. well wow. yeah that looks safe enough you know when in doubt just do it anyway. I don't know if we're gonna clear the topper on the way out, to be honest. I don't know what that was either. Well, I think we might have to rejigger it. put it in here then put the topper on because I'm a genius hmm. well, as you can see I'm in a bit of a pickle um, I have an idea maybe where's my handle it's under the tailgate down See what we can do. Again, safety first. So tighten up our boom. After you pinch your fingers in it, of course. Yeah. Oh, the ground's around here somewhere. Oh. All right. Kind of hurt.
Maybe we can get it out. Just a touch. If you've ever heard the expression of a monkey performing coitus with a football, this would be the definition. And we're hitting a topper. Try number 376. Oh. Tight as we can get. Oh, come on. Have I ever told you the tragedy of Dark Plague is so wise? And maybe next time I'll, I'll fill you in. That might be enough. All right, I need six arms, seven legs, Oh, there we go. We're clear of the top for now. By the way, if you care about a TPI, don't don't lift it by the runners. I fortunately do not give a single frick. Make sure you're safe. Now we got, where did all this wiring come from? We got extension cords, we got trailer wiring, all wrapped around the motor. Now I might want to lift it a little bit. There we go. Come on, get out of there. A little more. Why are you fighting me? I'm stuck on something, ain't I? Look at that, more extension cord. Well, really? I don't know how it got wedged under the distributor, but it did. There we go. Yeah, you guys could have told me about that. Come on now. Yeah. All right. Now, what we have here is failure to... No, what we have here is the front accessories that we need for my build for my son's truck. Now, a lot of you guys, if you're building... A vehicle that didn't come with a drivetrain this is the kind of stuff you need to think about if you don't have these parts you need to figure out where to source them now this front accessory drive obviously came out of my 87 z28 but it'll work in the truck so we have the alternator water pump power steering pump crank pulley that's all the stuff that we're gonna need so we're gonna go ahead and disassemble the front end of this motor obviously we're not gonna use smog pump because it locked up and they suck so, let's just start with randomly taking bolts out. Look, we removed the alternator. We'll just get the bracket out of the way. Well, after purging all of the cuss words I could think of, we got the water pump pulley off. We've got the power steering pump removed. Now we just need this bracket tree off. So there's a few bolts, nothing too terrible. 
Uh, of course, it goes over the exhaust manifold. I'm probably going to have to modify that for the headers, put some spacers in, but no big deal. Get them fuel lines out of the way. All right. And get the one off the manifold, and I think we'll be all right. I think. Well, it's all loose. What kind of godforsaken jigsaw puzzle is this? Yeah. Yeah, fuel lines, we don't need them anyway. There we go. Three brackets to hold the pump on if you don't count the one on the pump. Thanks, GM. Now, another important thing to remember, if you're taking the accessories off a particular vehicle, you want to get a water pump for that vehicle. As you can see on this one, on the F-Body water pump and accessories, it's got two bosses here to mount either your smog pump and your alternator. So make sure you get the water pump that corresponds with the front accessories you're using. Also, some are reverse rotation like the newer serpentine systems, whereas this one is a standard rotation. So if you do that, take a standard rotation, belt drive and accessories, you want to keep with that. Because if you spin the water pump the wrong way, if you get a newer water pump, say for a Vortec motor, when you're using a swirl port TPI, you'll end up with overheating issues. So just remember your belt set up and the proper rotation of the pump and you'll be all right. So we got everything stripped off the front of this that I'm gonna need for now. So next step is we're gonna try and get this 700 R4 off the back. So I'll try and get this spun around and we'll go for that. All right, I got the dust cover off. It's just a couple 10 millimeter bolts. But this is where I strongly recommend that if you have something like this laying around that you're pulling out of a project to replace it, it saved everything you can. Case in point, I clearly need a starter for that 350 in there. Well, this car had a newer starter on it and the new motor I put in had the starter with it. So we're gonna save the starter. Make sure you keep all your bolts, too, because there's nothing worse than getting into a project and realizing that uh, you don't have all the bolts. So, one good starter. But so let me just double check the 350 to make sure it'll bolt up. Okay, we're in good shape. On the 305s, the starter bolts, at least this generation 305, starter bolts are straight in line. Now, on most blocks, they'll also accept the diagonal pattern. This one and that 350 Vortec motor are the same. So we can use that starter. We'll save the bolts. And now it's time to take our flex plate bolts out to remove the transmission. Uh, oh, excuse me. All right. Now this is probably a conglomeration of 47 different bolt sizes, knowing GM. So we got some 14 mils. Transmission is removed. <laughs> that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to go. So make sure you don't destroy your TV cable. And now we got the 700R4 for my son's truck. Thankfully, I didn't actually have to pick it up. There we go. Got the transmission. 
Now, as far as the rest of this engine goes, we're gonna set it down because there's still plenty to use on this engine for the new build. So I'm gonna spin it around, get it set down, and uh, I'm also kind of curious because this lost cylinder seven. It just went, so we're gonna tear it down and see what happened. Then we're gonna get in the cylinder head tech. So stick with us. All right, it's time to tear down this TPI and get the goodies that lay beneath. Regular bolts out. Most of these TPIs are all Torx bit BS, so hopefully we don't strip it. Well, we got her the intake plenum off, got the manifold off, and it's really unfortunate that this motor decided to, you know, leave the chat because it is actually really clean down in the valley. Now, mind you, this is a 34,000 miles Z28, and it lost number seven, and you can see how these ports are dry, and that one is sopping wet. That's our cylinder that went. So, we're going to go ahead and pull this head off and see what happened. Now, when it comes to taking hard parts off the heart of the engine, you should never put an impact on an engine. That being said... Go. Oh, we got this stupid pipe on the back side for the uh, small crap, so we'll go ahead and remove that quick. So it makes it that much easier to take the head off. Oh, that smells bad. You know, when you're tearing a motor down, you get that burnt internal oil smell. Oh God, it's worse than gear oil. All right, come on. Just about got, there we go. Yeah, the combustion chamber doesn't look all mad. Oh, my God. <laughs> something went wrong in this cylinder. I'll bring you guys in close in a second, but something was banging around in there. Well, here you go, guys. Here's the cylinder head off of the driver's side bank. You can see cylinder one looks pretty good. Cylinder two is pretty good. Cylinder three is all right, you know. The oil just come from me removing it, but uh, cylinder seven looks like some bad stuff happening here. We got witness marks all over the quench side of combustion chamber, but here's here's a dead giveaway that uh, cylinder seven is completely dead. <sighs> you see that right there? <laughs> the piston broke. And all this is what was left of the piston just bouncing around in there. And I don't see 
any indication of the top compression ring. What you're seeing is the scraper ring, the second piston ring. That is, uh, that's ungood. So that would explain why this engine was low on power and just burning a little bit of oil. Because if you look at its companion cylinder, that, that's what it's supposed to look like. Clean, I mean, black and sooty, but uh, you know, not, not pot marked like a ginger that's been in the sun for 50 years. But yeah, there's our giveaway. She's dead. And oh, you can feel a ridge right in there in a cylinder wall. I don't know how well you guys could see it, but I can feel that. Something got in there and gouged her all up. So that's the death of a 305. And I think what happened is it sat for 20 some years. We got it running. And I honestly think uh, injector number seven was kind of on the fritz. And you're out giving it, you know, having fun. Because this motor ran amazing. Didn't smoke at all. And I think that injector went to hell. Leaned her out when we were having some fun. And then just melted this cylinder down. Because that, that's real bad. <laughs> so, there ain't no saving that. Uh, I'm going to keep the block, keep the rotating assembly. Uh, all these, uh, I think, what is it, 87 and up TPI cars or roller motors. So, this has got roller cam, roller lifters, and all that. So, this is what we're keeping around. The heads are junk. They're, like I said, they're swirl ports, and we're going to get into that next. Is a little bit of head tech between a swirl port, a Vortec, and the AFR. So let's uh, let's keep at it. All right. Well, I jammed the head off of the Vortec 350 for my son's truck. Even comes fresh with a spider in it. <sighs> a dead spider. Now, going from right to left, we've got the LB9 TPI 305 head, which is slightly different from a swirl port head that would come on like a LO3 305. Uh, you have the L31 350 head for a Vortec, and then we have our AFR 195 Enforcer head. Now let's start with this little 305 head. Now, looking from the LB9 to the L31, you can see the difference in the shape of the combustion chamber, especially this area right here where it's more heart-shaped. This makes this a much more efficient combustion chamber. And this one, not so much. This is at the tail end of a smog era head. So if you're looking for a cylinder head to put on a project, I, I personally would stay away from the, you know, the... LB9, the L, well, not the L98, because the Corvettes, uh, late L98s, I think. Did they have aluminum heads? I don't remember. Anyway, the LB9 and the B2L, which would be the IROC 350 TPI, use this type of chamber. Now, if you were going to build one of those engines, you want to go on a budget, you want to bump up to the Vortec. Because it's got much better chamber design. It's just all around a better flowing head. Now getting into the specifics. The 305 head has 186 intake valves and a 1.5 exhaust. Stock Vortec along with uh, the L98, all that stuff, the B2L, 194, 150. Uh, the 305s, now a lot of guys say you know kick your camera stand a lot of guys tell you if you're on a budget put 305 heads on a 350 they'll make more power that's true to a point we all remember the ho five liter Monty ss heads that's what these really are and the reason why they make power is they've got a 58 cc combustion chamber which is way smaller than the 64 cc uh, Vortec head and smaller yet than even the L L98 or B2L. So there is an advantage to running these archaic heads is throwing them on will bump your compression up. But I personally don't think it's worth all the machine work to go through them. So we got 
Small chamber, small valve. Good for a 305, not that great. We've got bigger chamber, but yet smaller than the previous smog era heads with bigger valves for a 350. And then let's move in to the AFR. And we're going to compare the combustion chamber of the Vortec and the AFR. So both of these heads are 64 cc chambers but looking at the design of the chamber you can tell that the afr is a much more efficient design there's no hard edges around the spark plug coming in whereas the vortex got this flat edge lots of hard edges and that's where you can concentrate heat you won't be able to run basically as hot a hot of a combustion chamber with these heads regardless of what they're made out of because of these hard points whereas the AFR is nice and smooth and of course the AFR has 202 intake and 160 exhaust now we're going to spin all these heads around to looking at their intake ports so if we spin the LB9 the L31 next to each other and then let's bring this AFR in here ah, there we go now looking at the LB9 versus the Vortec don't let this fool you here the valves act or the ports actually not that big that's just gasket surface so if we shine a light on it you can actually see the shape of the intake port which is similar to the Vortec as far as intake port size and are not far off on intake flow. I believe the LB9s are 160 cc intake runners. The Vortex are 170. So really not bad for 305, but you know, just an old archaic head. They're runner lengths and the way they bump in to the valve are about the same I'll get you in here quick so you see how the path to the valve is you know you got a couple bumps here and there and here's your bottleneck and you look in the Vortec head it's quite similar so the Vortec heads were kind of based on what they were already going with at the time and obviously you could see the difference in the bolt pattern how these are straight up and down. These are your old classic, well, TPI pattern where you have the EGR cross over here. That's blocked off. And other than that, fairly similar head. Uh, but if you compare the Vortec port to the AFR, where this is 195 cc, you could see the port is physically bigger. They lowered the port floor which gives you a lot of flow. You see how there's not really a bump outside of the port going in, whereas this one is much more pronounced, ramping up. And these are as cast, of course. So you look at where it gets to the valve, and it's got kind of like a div divergent point to help guide air into the valve, whereas a Vortec, you basically just pile in to... The valve guide now that's just intake and combustion chambers on these so i'll put you back on the stand and uh we'll go ahead and look at valve train so we'll spin the lb9 move the afr and the l31 now the lb9 and the l31 are incredibly similar to the fact that they both have center bolt valve covers, press and rocker studs, which aren't necessarily good for high lift or high spring pressures. You'll rip one of them right out of the head. Now the difference between the two, as you could see, is the uh, valve keepers and the valve springs themselves. So, See how these are shrouded? Both heads can't take a whole lot of lift. They're just 
you know, they're factory heads for a Vortec, and I'm sure the LB9, you got to grind down the guides. You'd have to cut down the rocker stud stands to be able to put thread in rockers. And just, we'll pull you back off the stand here. If we can look inside the valve here, I don't know how well you guys can see this, but, oh, there it is. The valve seal is right there under that coil. So that doesn't give you a whole lot of lift. These heads are only good for, in reality, about 450 without machine work. Whereas the AFR, you see the distance there. These are good for 600. And then on the LB9, you can barely see it because it's got umbrella seals and a, a damper inside the main spring, whereas the Vortec does not. These are much better springs, actually. So let's spin them around to the exhaust side and kind of show you what we got going on here. And there is a more pronounced difference between the Vortec and and the TPI head, you could see the exhaust valve there. It's relatively flat, or the exhaust port, I should say. But on a Vortec, it's actually raised just slightly. You see the difference between the two heads. The Vortec exhaust port is actually brought up, which really helps flow. And that's kind of what really helps these heads. So physically looking at both heads, this port is further towards the valve cover and this port is further towards the deck of the block. So the Vortec does flow better on the exhaust than a TPI head does, or even a swirl port. They're fairly similar, just not exactly the same. The AFR has a very nice ramped exhaust port, direct flow, much bigger port than the Vortec. So if I could turn this, I mean, look at the size difference in those exhaust ports. Again, uh, it's moved up like a Vortec because it's a good design. So, but just right there, if you're going to build a motor and you're questioning heads, and honestly, the money you're going to spend on machine work, especially on a TPI head or a swirl port to make it perform for what you want to do is going to far outweigh the cost of these uh, 195 AFRs. And I'm just saying for 1200 bucks, you're getting everything you need. The only thing is if you're going to run these heads on a 305, being a 202.16 valve, uh, you're probably going to run into shrouding issues or even issues with inside the bore. Uh, you probably have to clearance a block just to make these heads work. So if you're going to build a 305, what I would do, honestly, is either get uh, AFR smallest head or they make a Vortec 305 head that would be designated as an L30. So you get the benefits of the raised exhaust port, a little better intake port, better springs, uh, just all around better flow. So if you're building 305, go with an L30 Vortec. If you're going to build a budget 350 and you have these laying around, slap them on. But just know that they're not that efficient of a combustion chamber. They will raise your compression, but they suck on flow. Uh, really, just for the price, you can't beat the AFR. So that's a little bit of cylinder head tech that I could share with you guys with my builds. And, you know, I'm budget friendly. That's why I just tore apart that uh, TPI so we could have parts to finish building this motor. And, of course, the 700R4. So on this engine now, uh, actually looking at it, it's not gacked or nothing. Obviously, it's sat forever, but uh, this is, there's no uh, gouges up and down in the cylinder, even on, uh, on a thrust side here. So that's good news, but this is worth a hone and re-ring, throw new bearings in. So we're going to order that. So the next part in this video is I'm going to go real quick. Just we're going to lightly bolt on the aluminum cylinder head with the head gasket. And we're going to measure push rod length. So a couple tips there. And then we'll finish this one up. Okay. Well, I pulled the lifters out. And checked them to see if they're stuck or anything. 
which you can do take the push rod and just shove it down in the lifter you can see some of these are actually collapsed if you look inside the spring there so I'm gonna look and find two of the best lifters out of all of them keep the head gasket up here here we go this one looks decent there which what you also can and really should do when you're checking uh, if your push rod length is correct is go ahead and either get the spacers to make the lifter solid or have a couple of solid lifters that are the same length laying around. But that being said, as long as we're in the ballpark of push rod length, you'll see it once we get the head on and we'll run a couple push rods and just run the intake and exhaust on cylinder number one. So I'm gonna go ahead and just slam the old bolts in and just snug it down. You don't wanna torque the head down right now. You just wanna snug it in just, just enough to seat the head. And then you can verify your push rod length. So, we'll start by those. And this is going to get ARP hardware. Uh, factory bolts are torque to yield, so they stretch. You don't ever want to reuse them. And it's never really a good idea to reuse head bolts anyway. Just get new ones. At the end of the day, it's not that expensive. Just uh, go ahead and get yourself some new bolts. Should have one more laying around. Now we'll snag one off the 305. Yeah. And probably dropped it somewhere. I really don't feel like looking for it. So, what we'll do. is I'm not gonna hammer them down on this, don't worry, I'm just gonna snug them. But you wanna do your typical bolt head pattern, which, once I find my damn socket that I had, be around here somewhere. Uh, again, working on cars, can't find nothing. Oh, there it is. Okay, like I said, I'm not going to hammer these down because number one, this is an aluminum head. So you want to be extra careful. Just run it down easy. Be real careful about, you know, clearly you don't want to work a brand new head. down turn the torque down on this there we go like I said nice and easy you don't want to get crazy
And what you're hearing up here when it's clicking, it's actually getting through the crap and the threads. Which, by the way, there we go. By the way, when you go to assemble the motor for real, which we'll go through when we do the uh, overhaul on the short block, is you want to clean all your threads. But for the purposes right now, we're not we're not torquing anything. This is not a finished deal. So we don't have to worry about it. See, there's plenty there. Just hand tighten. Just to make sure the head's seated. That way we get an accurate measurement on our push rod length. And the reason I'm doing this right now is the next order I make, hopefully, is the last order. Because I've made several orders to Summit Racing and I'd, I'd rather just be done ordering stuff, to be honest. Which will never happen. We all know this. There we go. Now it might look like I'm swinging this wildly, but I'm just hitting it until I could just not wing it. So once she bottoms out, we're good. Which I need to swap sockets for that one, but she should be plenty seated. There we go. Find the one to fit. Yeah, of course. Oh, where's that other socket? There it is. Yeah, I know I'm dirtying up my pretty AFR heads, but it is what it is. There we go. So the head's now seated. What we're gonna do is we're gonna drop the push rods in. I'm actually gonna loosen up these guides a little bit so we can align the push rods. So, just a little tweak on each one of them. I don't have these crazy tight, so just using a wrench will do fine. Clearly when you tighten these down, you wanna use a socket, but you wanna get your push rods in line with the tip of your valves the best you can. So like that. There we go. All right. Now... We're gonna grab some rockers. Grab a couple of rockers and some poly locks, and I'll grab a Sharpie and we'll show you how we do this. So we'll set these down and we'll be right back. Okay, now when you're measuring for push rod length, we got a push rods in here. What you wanna do, get yourself a black Sharpie Go ahead and color the tip of both the top of your stems of your valves. Let that dry for a second. We'll move you over here so maybe you can see it better. There you go. You can see how we have the tips of our valves colored. Now, we're going to go ahead and use the rockers that uh, will be on the finished motor. And one thing to remember with a roller rocker is there's a flat area in there. On the other side, it's round. So always make sure that the flat area is up so it can mate with your poly lock and sit on a flat surface so the trunnion can 
pivot correctly, you won't have any issues. Just remember that. So try not to drop our Allen wrench in here. So we're just going to loosely put our rockers on. I'm going to back the poly locks off. That way we can adjust it properly. So make sure those are good and loose. And so now we're going to rotate the motor to where we see both of the lifters at the same area in the bottom of their bore. So I'll bring you around and show you that. Hip. After I knocked the damn stand around. So, as you can see, we're not set up to lashes yet because the lifter for the intake is actually up. So we're gonna rotate this engine until they're even. All right, see how those are both down now. We can go ahead and begin to lash. We're actually gonna bring it up to top dead center just to verify, which is right over here on the crank. All right, so we're on the base circle of both lobes on the cam on number one. So now we can go ahead and run down our poly locks. There we go, number one, number two. Now, in order to do a proper lash on any engine, well, especially a small block 350 that's hydraulic, is you want to be able to turn the push rod. So on number one, we can turn the push rod. You can see that I can turn it. I have the intake on number one just a touch too tight so we're gonna back that off until I can just turn it there we go so I could turn both push rods and we're gonna just for this sake we're gonna go a quarter inch a quarter turn of lash so start at six o'clock and head up to nine o'clock but I gotta back my poly lock out a little more Make sure these are out far enough. All right, there we go. Where we were, up to nine o'clock, up to nine o'clock. Now the way I'm doing this with the poly locks is not actually a way you're gonna lash them if you have roller rockers. And when we assemble the engine, I'll show you the proper way to do it. But we should be good now. I could just just hardly turn them, which is fine, you know, on a quarter inch, so we could start to check our push rod length. Now, what you want to look at right here, and I'll bring you down, is to see where the rollers are riding on the tips of your valve. So I'm going to roll the engine over a, a full couple revolutions to give these a chance to ride down and up on the valves. So, here we go. Set this down. Let's turn this engine over and see what kind of a pattern we have. You can see the exhaust, open and closed, intake, open and closed. Back to exhaust. There we go, there we go. You know, do a couple revolutions just so you get your pattern down and then get it back down to the base circle of the cam, which is where we're at. Bring it back to top dead center. Now we can go ahead and pull our rockers off, back the poly lock off.
All right. There we go. And now we can see if our push rod length is correct, we should have a mark dead center of the top of the valve stem. Be careful not to move around the rockers too much when you're removing them to, you know, give you a false indication of where they're riding. So, there we go. Let's pop you out here. It's hard to see with the sun, but you can see that it's pretty close. I mean, I'd be alright with that. That's pretty much in the center of the valve stem. There we go. There's a better angle. This one is a little forward, but it's not... What you really want is you don't want it rolling off the edge of the valve stem. So I think with the stock push rod length, we'll be all right here. I don't think there'll be any issues. Um, so there you go. There's how you check push rod length when you know you're going to be in a neighborhood of the push rod length you need. These are stock length push rods. And I was just curious on an AFR head if, you know, the, the valve is the same height and all that. And we're good. And the reason why I'm me measuring for push rod length is because with valve guides, you have to run hearted push rods. You can't run the factory ones. So I wanted to verify the length of these are correct so I could just order factory length push rods that are hardened. Well, there we go, guys. I hope uh, we all were entertained and learned something out of this video. Now, the previous check I did to verify push rod length I want to make a very clear note here is that the cam that is going in this engine is for this engine which means the base circle of the cam which means when it's off the lobe is the same as the camshaft in here so that's why I can use the stock cam to verify push rod length because the base circle is the same now if you're building say uh roller motor like this and you put a retrofit roller cam in it it actually has a smaller base circle so your push rod length is going to be way off now that just so you know uh comp you know lunati all those guys will help you out with a proper push rod length but just know if you have a roller motor Try to get a roller motor cam, you know, one that's non-retrofit, one that's actually for these, so you don't have to worry about push rod length. But if you do go retrofit, just know the base circle's smaller and you will need longer push rods. But that's, uh, I think that's all I got for you guys today. I'm still waiting on my camshaft to show up for this engine. If it does, I'll give you guys a short of how much I am in love with it. So there you go. I'm going to pull this head back off, put it back on the shelf. We're going to get a re-ring kit, new bearings for it. So the next video, we're going to pop this 350 apart. There's not any real big ring ridge on it. So we don't have to worry about that. No scoring in the cylinder walls, at least on this bank. We'll, uh, we'll hone it out. We'll re-ring it. We'll measure the crank. We'll measure all of the main journals and the rod journals to make sure everything's going to be okay. And this will be a brand new 350 after all. Kind of sucks spending $500 on a long block for almost nothing other than a chunk of iron. But that's part of hot rodding. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. And maybe give you a little inspiration on how to pick those parts off of past projects to make your present one work. So like share subscribe you can find me on facebook at tnt garage you can find me on instagram at t.n.t underscore garage and uh go ahead you know it ain't gonna hurt you to like or subscribe leave a comment whether you love it or you tell me how stupid i am it doesn't matter i appreciate each and every one of you that watch these videos let's make our dreams com come true all together and uh Never quit wrenching. Remember that. Thanks again, guys.